Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar on the latest pay movement and trends in the UAE and GCC. I've got Robert Mosley sitting here waiting to go, um, but before I hand over to him, I'm just going to walk you through um, what the HR Observer is about because we're held under the auspices of the HR Observer. Um, it's an initiative from our company um, and it's just aimed at um, making HR more visible in this part of the region. And we do this through a Twitter feed as well as um, a Facebook page and a blog. Sorry, there seems to be something wrong with my slides that they're not moving. Okay, we also have a LinkedIn group. Um, also a little bit of housekeeping to help the afternoon go smoothly. If you could please keep your on, um, questions to the end of the webinar, that would be very useful. Rob has already allocated time to answer them. Um, you will find at the bottom right of your webinar page, um, there's a little chat box and this is where you can communicate with us um, and then we'll pick up the questions right at the end. The slides that you see as well as the recording of the entire webinar will be available um, within the next few days and we will email you links to them. So, when we finish, you'll see a little survey box pop up and if you could please allocate a few minutes of your time to answer the questions in the survey it would help us do better for the next time and hopefully bring you webinars on subjects that you're interested in. So without any further delay, I'll hand you over to Robert. Thank you very much. Sherry didn't really mean do better for the next time because this is going to be brilliant as it is. So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen and everyone. Uh, welcome to this webinar on pay trends in the GCC and the UAE. I'll uh, take you through this today. It'll take about 30, 35 minutes, and then I'll happily answer questions at the end. So if you do have questions, just make a little note of them on a bit of paper where you're sitting. And when I get to questions at the end, I'll say, type now. And whoever types first gets their questions in. If you start typing questions now, I won't get to see them because they're going to come up on a different screen in front of me at the end of the presentation. So please hold back on questions till the end. My background for those of you that I haven't had the pleasure of meeting and, and quite a lot of the names on the screen, I know you well. Uh, so to those of you I know, good afternoon. My background, six years with Hay Group way, way back in the 1980s. From Hay, I joined Emirates Airline and Emirates Group back in 1990 and spent uh, just over 13 years with Emirates here in Dubai as the Senior Vice President for Human Resources. A few other jobs around the Gulf, including Head of HR for Qatar Airways and then a couple of years in uh, Abu Dhabi with Etihad and then for the last seven or eight years running my own small little consulting business, me on my own, specializing in compensation and benefits working now with about 450 different companies in the region, also on many remuneration committees, um, and also working with a group of airlines globally as well. So my passion really is, are we paying people correctly? Are we rewarding them fairly? And what's going on in the market? Even though I was head of HR and running HR, my passion was still always Comp and Ben, and that's, that's what I'm enjoying doing nowadays brings me into contact with, with hundreds of companies each year, especially this last six weeks of companies have been getting ready or implementing their January reviews, because I want you to listen to something. Listen to it now. What did you just hear? The silent recession. Things have gone quiet in the last six months. Pay markets have slowed down rapidly. If you haven't kept your finger on the pulse and you've just done a 5% pay review in January this year, oh boy, you've spent more than you need to. So let's take a look at the trends. In this webinar today on pay trends in the UAE, I'm going to talk about what's happening on salary, what's happening on allowances, what's happening on bonuses, because we're coming up to a really fascinating March and April period this year when companies are paying out the bonuses from 2015. What's happening to benefits and, and what are the forecasts? What do we think will happen over the next 12 months? 
what, what exactly is, is going on. And then at the end, I'll happily take your questions. So as an introduction, if you're going to pay your people fairly and you're going to reward them and you're going to motivate them, you've really got to understand the golden triangle of remuneration. You have to understand the jobs that your people are doing. And that means organization design, get the structures right, job analysis, get to know who does what, what the different jobs are, why they exist and what they're contributing. Give the employee a job description so they know what's expected of them and that you can set goals and targets against that job description. Make sure you've evaluated the job using a good, robust job evaluation system such as Hay or Towers Perrin or Watson, Towers Watson or, or Mercer. And then put the jobs into a, a logical and fair grading structure. But you also need to know the people who are doing those jobs. And in particular, how well are they performing? What sort of key result areas are you asking them to do? What key performance indicators are you giving them as their goals and objectives? What are you asking them to achieve? And how are you asking them to achieve those goals? What sort of behaviors, what sort of competencies are you expecting from your employees? At the beginning of the year, we set the goals and objectives. At the beginning of the year, we outline the behaviors that we're looking for. And at the end of the year, we bring it together into an appraisal. Did you meet your goals? Did you exceed your goals? Did you show the right behaviors? Out of the appraisal comes a performance rating. And then we use those ratings in the pay reviews, many of which are going on now, 1st of January or 1st of April. The annual pay review and the annual bonus payments with most companies about to pay out their bonuses at the end of March, that has an impact on pay. Jobs, of course, are very internal within the company. The people and how they're performing are internal within the company. But you need to look outside as well. What's going on in the market? What's your pay strategy? What are you trying to achieve? What sort of pay data and what surveys can you get access to? How can you benchmark your company against those other companies and determine if your remuneration is competitive? And how do you make decisions about adjusting your pay ranges and adjusting your allowances to meet changing market conditions and stay competitive? And this is what we often call the, the golden triangle of job evaluation. And part of that is doing your annual pay review process, which means making changes to your allowances and making changes to the salaries of staff, the annual pay review. Now, of course, we all know that over the last year, the price of a barrel of oil has plummeted. This slide, when I put it together to prepare the presentation a few weeks ago, oil was still up at about $40, $45. And of course, it's gone down even further. It was $27.02 this morning. And that's having a major impact on the economy of the region. That's where the silent recession is coming from. Inflation's also starting to pick up a little bit. It's been hovering at the 2 2.5% mark. It's just bubbling up to about 3% now, just over 3% in Qatar and Iman and around 3% here in the UAE. But GDP growth is still strong. It's fallen a little bit. It was about 4 5% last year. It's down to 32 but if we get to the point where the inflation and the GDP numbers cross, that's always a clear sign that there's a recession just around the corner. And we're at that point now. Interestingly, employee voluntary resignation rates have actually gone up in the last year. And that's also often a sign that things are about to slow down. People make a move quickly before the recession kicks in, because once a slowdown is here, it's not a good idea to change jobs. You stay put and stay where you are. So we often see this little bubble six, nine months before times go a little bit weak. So GDP doing okay but falling. Inflation starting to pick up a little bit. Thankfully, in the region, it's not just money anymore that attracts people. We're seeing, particularly with the younger age groups, 
that they are more worried now about career advancement, career development, and, and job security. People used to come to the region purely to make money, to make a decent salary, and, and any type of career opportunities or L&D opportunities were a bonus. But times are different now. People come here for a career. So it's those other factors like career advancement, learning and development, etc., that are now just as important as money. So money, in fact, for the, the younger groups, 30 or under, doesn't actually picture in their top three priorities. It's, it's still the top priority for the, the more mature employee. But it's, uh, it's not such a key challenge, not such a key issue for, for the younger age groups. So we've got to get money right, but there's other things we must get right as well. So what are the trends? Before I go into the trends, let's get some terminology under our belts first so that we've got a similar understanding of, of key words. The Management Consultants Association that governs all of the big consulting companies, including small ones like me, has seven definitions. Basic salary, that's your monthly salary multiplied by 12 months. Base salary, which is the previous thing, basic salary, plus if you get it, a guaranteed 13th month payment. Guaranteed fixed cash, which is the previous thing, base salary, plus your allowances, your housing allowance, your transport allowance, your mobile telephone allowance. Total cash or total cash earnings is the previous thing, guaranteed fixed cash, plus your bonus schemes, your company incentives, your profit share plans. Total remuneration, we then add in benefits, compensation and benefits. What are the cost of your medical insurance schemes? What are the cost of your school fees and education subsidies for children? What are the costs of the annual leave tickets for the expats going home, etc.? Then we can add in all the other tangible terms and conditions like fantastic annual holidays that you might get or extended maternity leave, anything over and beyond the norm. And then, of course, what does the government have to contribute to the government? Here in the UAE, the pension plan contributions for the Emirati nationals. If you're in Amman, the PASI contributions. If you're in Saudi, the GOSI contributions. What does the company send to the government? And the big main pay survey providers, who do I mean by the main survey providers? Well, here in the GCC on my shopping list would be companies like Hay Group, Mercer's, Towers Watson, and Aon Hewitt. Thankfully, they pretty much follow these definitions. So if you're looking at a pay survey that looks at total cash, total cash is defined as the same thing in all of the big four. So it's reliable and it's robust. And most of the big four are certainly covering salary, base salary, fixed cash, guaranteed fixed cash, and total cash. But the data on total remuneration and certainly on reward and cost of employment is a little harder to obtain. But in the region, we're very fortunate to have some very good sources of surveys, especially looking at total cash. So let's have a look at some of the trends. Our focus today, I'm going to look at basic salary, the monthly salary times 12. I'm going to look at guaranteed fixed cash, what's happening beyond salary, what's happening on the allowances, the housing allowances, the transport allowances in particular. What's happening on bonuses, what have we been seeing as the trend on bonuses and what might we see this coming March when the new round of bonus payments kicks in, total cash. And what are we seeing on the major benefits, the medical schemes, the education of school fees for children, etc.? I'm going to focus on these four levels of the remuneration package. So let me start. Let me start with basic salary. This time last year, when we did the webinar, base salary had been moving at about 5, 5.5% during 2014. And the companies at the end of 2014, looking ahead to 2015, were forecasting that it would carry on at about 5%. And the GCC region 
uh, in in general is pretty much ahead of most of the world. Most of Europe, most of uh, the Near East is hovering at two or three percent. The Americas and South America, a little bit higher, four or five percent. But if you look at this dial sort of between one o'clock and, and three o'clock, it's the Middle East region that's actually powering ahead. And Asia as well, Malaysia, the Philippines, Indonesia, all doing relatively higher when it comes to pay increases. So this time a year ago, we were all thinking around 5% would be roughly what we were budgeting for our pay reviews. But now we're a year on, and now we realize Times have been difficult. Oil prices have been falling. Revenues are struggling. And now, with the benefit of hindsight, 5% really was a little bit too high. And it turns out that 4% is about the headline figure. Most of the main surveys are saying that the market moved by about 4% in the last 12 months. But that's a real general headline figure. What exactly does 4% mean? Is it constant across all industries? Is it constant across all job levels? Well, job levels, no. We've seen a real reversal in the last 12 months on differentials. From 2009 to 2014, year after year, the biggest increases were for the biggest jobs, the senior management. And the smallest jobs, our clerical colleagues, our manual workers, our secretaries, our drivers, they were getting the smallest increases, but not last year. Last year saw a real U-turn on this, and actually it's the other way around. In the last 12 months, it's the lower jobs that have had the bigger increases, 45 to 5%. It's the mid-level professional jobs that have done a little bit worse, and it's the managerial jobs that have seen the lower increases. Senior management bless them, they manage to protect themselves and still have a nice 4, 4.5% increase. But the pain was at the management level, 3 to 3.5%. So yes, it was 4% on average across the board, bigger at lower jobs, smaller in the middle and at the managerial jobs. 4% as a headline figure is also masking some significant trends by industry. With the oil price doing so poorly, not surprisingly last year, it's the oil industry and the gas industry that saw the lowest levels of pay increases. And as we've gone into 2016, many of them in January actually had a pay freeze this year. The sectors that did well last year were retail and automotives and the banks and the financial services. Real estate had a good year, insurance had a good year, 4% or more in those sectors which is actually quite different to what it was in 2013, 2014. So some of those sectors which had tighter budgets two or three years ago, they've managed to do a little bit of catching up. So 4% is the headline figure, but across the sectors, it could be anything from 2 to 6%. In terms of the rank order of sectors, yes, the oil and gas still pay the highest for any given job. Who pays more? Who pays less? Oil and gas is still at the top. The sectors in blue on this slide are those that are doing better and are moving up the rank order table. The sectors in red are the ones that have dropped down in the rank order table. And this is scarily similar to the latter half of 2008 when we also saw the warning signs with construction going down, healthcare going down, hotels and hospitality go down. That really is a sure sign that something is up in the economy. We can predict it six months out before it hits us. And here's the prediction now. In terms of the method of pay reviews, most companies now are choosing to make those pay reviews linked to performance. Very, very few companies are still doing fixed increments or seniority increments fixed for all staff. Most companies now trend is towards merit increase and pay for performance. And most companies now are also realizing that if someone's hit the maximum pay scale, we've still got to do something to encourage and motivate those people and hence lump sum merit bonuses. 
If you don't know what a lump sum merit bonus is, then come on my compensation training course with Informa in April. So basic salary, headline figure, 4%. Well, let's go beyond salary. Let's look at allowances. If we combine salary and allowances together and we look at guaranteed cash, the headline figure now is 3.5%. It's gone down. If the salary element is moving by 4%, it tells us that the allowances element is actually moving by less, only by about 3%. Yes, in the early part, the first six months of 2015, we did see housing allowances move by 5, 6, 7%. But come the second half of the year, there were virtually no movements. In fact, in the second half of the year, actual housing rentals have dropped by about 8% here in the UAE, dropped by about 5% in Qatar and Amman. And so as we enter 2016, I'm not expecting to see much movement, if any, on allowances. So the fixed cash, salary and allowances combined, the headline figure now, what's gone on in the past 12 months, 5.4% a year ago, down to 3.5% now, and as 2016 is already beginning to unfold, it's falling even further. The typical pay reviews that got implemented in January this year were actually only at about the 3% level. Senior management didn't do so well. Allowances got frozen at those levels. Not much increase on allowances at all. So the fixed cash has only gone up by about 3.5%, 3.4%. Middle management, 3.1%, supervisory, 3.3%, clerical, 2.7%. So allowances really haven't been moving by much at all. The emphasis has been very much on salary. In terms of housing allowances, the values of allowances for the junior jobs are still pretty adequate, more than what employees tend to be paying. Those green lines, higher than typical costs, whereas for higher jobs, the allowance tends to be more of a subsidy. What the employees actually spending is a little bit less than what the allowance is providing for. So many companies aren't even calling it a housing allowance anymore. They're calling it a housing subsidy. And my thanks to, to Towers Watson for this extremely good slide. In terms of sectors then, which sectors pay more, which sectors pay less, the positioning down the left-hand side, which sectors had bigger increases and which sectors had smaller increases going across from left to right. This one comes from Hay Group's presentation. The retail, the automotive section sectors, which are relatively lower paid, they've been doing some catch up, six, six and a half percent. The oil sector and the healthcare sectors, which are relatively higher paid, well, they've only had two, two and a half percent increases. So it really is a year of, of consolidation. The gap between nationals and expats or impats, depending on what you call them, here in the UAE is widening. Salaries for nationals have really boomed ahead. Salaries for expats, nowhere near as much. The gap now is around 50-60% on guaranteed cash. But with a minimum gap of about 2,500 dirhams a month at lower levels, but at upper levels that gap gets capped typically at about 9,000 dirhams a month. So actually, if you look at it across different jobs, for nationals, the gap is huge at the lower level jobs. If there's a minimum gap of about 2,500 dirhams, you're talking about roughly double. An Emirati in those lower grades will earn roughly double, if not more than double, what an expat earns. But as you move up the grade structures towards senior management, when that gap gets capped at about 9,000 dirhams, well, that might only be a 10% gap. So the gap between nationals and non-nationals is widening, especially in the lower grades and the supervisory grades, and, and that will continue in 2016. The gap between Abu Dhabi and Dubai is falling. 
housing prices didn't move as much this year in Abu Dhabi as they did in Dubai. The gap is closing a bit, but Abu Dhabi is still significantly higher than Dubai, all due to the significantly higher housing costs. It's about a 20% difference in the pay package for guaranteed cash, not on the salaries, but it's all in the housing allowances. Housing allowances typically 40 to 50% higher in Abu Dhabi compared to Dubai. Okay, so the headline figure on basic salary is 4%. The headline figure on salary and allowances combined is about 3.5%. What happens if we now add in bonuses? What happens if we now put in company profit share plans, bonus schemes, productivity, performance bonuses, and we look at total cash? The headline figure, 3.5% again. Bonus payments during 2015 based on 2014 results were roughly just below what they were targeted to be. Previous year, bonuses were a little bit higher than targeted. Last year, bonuses were about 10% lower than targeted. And now we're entering 2016. Bonuses will again be a little bit lower than targeted, possibly at around 85% of on-target levels. There's still going to be some good bonus payments, but they're not quite at target levels. Most companies have just fallen short on their budgets and their profit to goals in the past year. So the headline figure when we add in bonuses is that the total package, cash, salary and allowances and bonuses combined, slowed down from 5.5% in 2014, slowed down significantly to 3.5% in 2015. And I would be most surprised if it was higher than 3% in 2016. Let's see what the second half of the year brings. Bonuses, senior management, the on-target bonus in orange, a little bit less than target. Same again for supervisory. But clerical, middle manager, they got a little bit better bonus than target. They, they were doing better at hitting their goals and targets. But across the board, typical bonus payments last year were just lower than target levels. Bonuses vary significantly across sector. In, in banks, I've heard of some bonuses hitting the seven, eight, nine months territory again. But average in banks is about four, four and a half months. On the other hand, average in oil companies was about two months. Across all sectors, the typical bonus last year was just over two, and a half, two months of, of basic salary. It still means then that the majority of the money that we're paying in the Middle East is, is fixed. It's guaranteed. The salary is guaranteed. The allowances are guaranteed. It's only the bonuses that is variable based on company results. And, and that probably doesn't count as more than 5 or 8% of the total package. Bonuses are a relatively insignificant portion of the total cash for clerical jobs. They get a bit bigger as jobs get bigger and grades go higher. But the variable component is still only about 13% of the cash package for, for senior management. We're still in a predominantly fixed package environment here in the GCC. So we've looked at salary, headline figure 4%. We've looked at guaranteed cash, including allowances, and total cash, including bonuses, headline figure 3.5%. So what's happening on benefits? If we look at total remuneration movements in the last year, the headline figure picks up slightly, 3.8%. So that's telling us that benefits have been risen by a little bit more than the rest of the package. And roughly 2015, benefit costs for most companies were up by about 6 or 7%. And the bulk of that was driven by medical insurance premiums, which were up sharply, 7 8%, and school fee education costs, which were up well above inflation, 4 or 5 or even 6%. So benefits are becoming a slightly more painful aspect of the package, costing us more in the overall mix. School fees now, average education school fees per child per annum, 
during 2015 were about 42,000 at senior management. It means that no way are we paying 100% of fees anymore as we used to back in the 1980s. Most school fees allowances now are covering about 70 to 75% of the actual cost and hence they are also typically called a school fees subsidy rather than a school fees allowance. All the other benefits are pretty static. Yes, healthcare costs are up and up sharply, but everything else in the package is pretty static. There's no big changes going on on things like life insurance or annual leave plans or disability schemes. There's no big movement towards provident schemes or retirement benefit schemes. The benefits package really is pretty static. Other than those costs, for school fees and healthcare, everything else should be pretty static at present. So the benefit trends, the big concern is healthcare costs and that's showing no sign at all of slowing down this year. Second biggest concern is education costs and most of the big schools have actually published up front what the school fee increases are going to be for the next five years so we know that they're going to move five, six percent year on year on year. Flexible benefits are not gaining traction at all. They're not on the increase. A lot of people are talking about them, but nothing is happening. Provident schemes, retirement schemes are not on the increase. Companies are not outsourcing gratuity schemes despite all the conversations, despite all the discussion. It's not happening and quite right not to do it as well. So where are we headed? Where are we going in 2016? What's actually happening? If you read the Hay Group and the Towers and the Mercer reports that got published at the latter end of last year, they were forecasting that suddenly we're going to snap back to 5% like we were in 2014 and that 2015 was just a bit of a temporary dip. But now we already know that these forecasts are too high. It was really unrealistic to think that suddenly, while the pay markets had been moving at 4 5% and were falling to 35 last year, why would they suddenly snap back to 5 And if inflation, which had been gradually creeping up, why would it fall suddenly to 25 Hindsight's a wonderful thing, and the markets are not going to snap back to 5% this year. They're going to fall even more. I think if I was doing this presentation to you this time next year, I'd be saying the headline figure was around 3%, possibly even less, depending on how the next three months unfold. January increases have been and gone for about 30% of companies in the region, and nearly a third of companies have done pay freezes or pay delays. They've said, we're going to wait. We're not going to do it in January going to wait three or four months. Let's see what happens in the economy. Maybe we'll do something in April. The April increases are coming up soon and companies are saying, what are we going to do? And the main figures that I'm hearing are in the region of 3%. So that's what I'm going to put my neck out and forecast as the 2016 number, 3% in that kind of territory. Okay, we've covered the main trends, we've looked at the main issues, so let me open up to you all for questions and answers. So if you've got any questions, now's the time to reach over to that little comments questions page and please feel to type them in and as I see them pop up on the screen, I'll, I'll read them out and I'll try my best to, uh, to get through the questions that I understand. Anybody want to ask anything? Not seeing anything yet. Here we go. Um, Rajesh says, many thanks for the wonderful presentation. Rajesh, thank you. My good wishes to everyone at Campac Middle East. I hope you're doing well. Mariam says, can I know what outsourcing of EOSB means? Well, some companies are talking to, let's say, fund managers, asset managers who would like to take away from the company the, uh, the, the book value of your end of service benefit gratuity and, in, and invest it in some way in the hope that it does better in their fund investment portfolio than it would do in, within the company. 
But quite frankly, you'd be crazy to do that at the moment because by keeping the end of service benefit in-house on the book value, cash, it means that you're actually reducing, reducing your cost of debt, your cost of interest if you had to, to raise money for capital by, by using that instead. So it doesn't make a lot of sense to, to outsource gratuity. Keep it on your books. Huda says, could you please tell us what do you mean by the 13th month included in base salary? Well, Huda, in certain countries of the world, there aren't 12 months. Believe it or not, if you lived in Hong Kong, there's 13 months. Yes, there's January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December. But two days ago, on Chinese New Year, by law, all companies in Hong Kong had a guaranteed 13th month bonus. So actually, in Hong Kong, you get your salaries 13 times a year. It's a legal requirement. If you're in Jordan, you get your salaries 14 times a year. It's a legal requirement. Turkey gets 16 salaries a year. How nice. Germany get 13. It doesn't actually mean you're earning more per year. It means you're earning less per month. If I want to pay you 120,000 a year, I could divide it by 12 and pay you 10,000 a month. Or I could divide it by 13 and pay you 9,200 a month. Dividing it by 13 and paying you 9,200 a month actually means I've just reduced my gratuity costs. I've reduced my overtime costs. And here in the GCC, about a quarter of companies have a guaranteed 13th month payment. It's a clever way of making the employees feel that they're getting some extra money, a nice extra 13th month bonus, but actually, you're reducing your gratuity costs, you're reducing your overtime costs, you're reducing the cost of your annual bonus, which is X month salary, because the salary rate is lower. So yes, here in the GCC, some companies pay 13 months rather than 12 months. So basic salary, which only looks at 12 months, isn't really comparing apples with apples. That's why base salary is a better comparison. Natalie says, the pay gap between Emiratis and expats, will it be reaching a non-salary gap at some point? No, it's, it's going to be it's going to be money. That gap is mainly going to be in money. Um, you can't recruit an Emirati graduate at the moment in Abu Dhabi for anything under 30,000 a month. It's cash. It's going to stay as cash. Try and harmonize the benefits as far as you can. The gap is all going to be in money. Ajis says, what would be the percentage of job cuts in this region? Ajith, if I had the answer to that one and I had a crystal ball, I could probably be a very rich man indeed. I hope it will be relatively small for those that do lose their jobs. But I think the reality is there are going to be job cuts. We're seeing it already in the oil sector. It's going to spill into other sectors. If I had to take a guess... I'd be saying about 5%, but I, I'm not an economist and I wouldn't like to put numbers on it. Lau says, thank you for the presentation. Quick one on bonuses. What's the best mechanism to clearly relate bonus with performance? I'm assuming you mean both company performance, what can you afford to pay, as well as employee performance. So for company performance, the quantum of bonus in the bonus pot should be linked to the company profitability and your balanced scorecard results at the company level. And then at the employee level, you should have a multiplier. Outstanding performers should get a multiplier maybe of two, double the, the average. Excellence, one and a half. Satisfactory is one. Marginals, nothing. And depending on your distribution curve of performance ratings, you should be able to stay in budget on that. So link it to performance with a multiplier or a gearing effect. Natalie again, are Emirati graduate male and female receiving the same pay at the same level of jobs? Well, we are not in an equality market here. And I'm afraid to say that the males are getting more than the females. But the gap's not massive. It's less than about 10%. So who knows, that just might be a margin of error in the surveys. But I think the reality is that there is a gender differential. Priya, what do you think the best motivating factor in retention strategy for 2016? 
I don't know if I'd be worried about retention this year. I think I'd be more worried about performance and more worried about sustainable profitability. And that means that if there's some staff that fall by the by, so be it. I would be worried about retaining my nationals. I would be worried about retention of the Emiratis. So I do expect that, let's say, three-year cash retention plans will see a, an increase in the next 12 months. But I'm more interested at the moment in performance. I'm more interested in getting what we need to make the company do well and survive and get through this temporary glitch. Sadly, when we're in these weak times, the first thing that tends to get cut is training budgets. But thankfully, those companies that are prudent and are looking ahead beyond the next six months and are saying, how are we going to retain those people? How are we going to get them to boom and motivate again? They're the ones that are still saying, well, we've got to carry on investing. And that's the way to get through a recession. Look at where you really do need to make cuts, but don't cut those things that are actually going to help you in the longer term. Samantha says, are there any new benefits that companies are thinking of implementing? In a nutshell, no. That's an easy one, isn't it? Sarah says, many thanks for the presentation. Normally, what is the difference in housing between male and females? Not much. Thankfully, over the last 30 years, two things have virtually vanished. The concept of single rates and married rates for housing have virtually vanished. And the concept of a male rate and a female rate has virtually vanished. Can't say that holds true in Saudi Arabia. In Saudi, we still see single and married rates. We still see male and female rates where the female rate is typically zero. But in the rest of the GCC, there's a lot less of that discrimination going on. And now it's more about an allowance for the job an allowance based on the grade and the job, without any distinguishing between married and single, without any distinguishing between male and female. Brinda asks, what about salary equalities in expat employees between male and female? Do you mean equalities really, or do you mean inequalities? The gender gap isn't just a national one, it's also an expat one, and it's roughly 12%, although there's very little data on it, because it's one of those political hot potatoes. But that actually isn't as big as the gap as it is in Europe. The gender gap in the UK, where I come from, is still about 15% males above females, despite the fact that there's supposedly legislation that makes such things uh, not good practice. Any more? I think we're at the end. So I shall say, unless there's any questions, Brinda says, how are education benefits given to employees and to what level? Typically, Hay level 16 and above, Towers Watson class 12 and above, Mercer 56 and above, depending on what system you're using. Typically, reimbursement of fees with payments made directly to the school, not through the employee. Typically, 75% of actuals up to a maximum of, for example, 40,000 dirhams per child per annum. Most companies don't put the cash through the employees. They pay it direct to the school. How do trends look for manufacturing? Pretty much the same as the trends in all other industries. Easy one. Pavan says, our company is looking at reducing housing allowances. Haven't seen much of it yet. Companies are trying their best not to make cuts. The, the drop in housing rentals isn't that significant that the allowances we're paying is so much massively above the reality. The, the differential's not big enough yet to justify cuts. But I'm sure if this oil price stays low for the whole of 2016, which it may well do, then we might see something cutting towards the latter half of the year. Let's see. Noreen says, would it be possible to receive a copy of your representation? Naveen, contact Informa. It'll be up on the website for download for the next couple of months. I'm sure it should be. Brinda says, are housing allowances and utilities allowances lumped together? It depends, Brinda. 
there's actually three big approaches in the golf. There's what I'd call the 60-40 approach, that you pay someone a gross salary, and then you say, well, 60% of that will be basic salary for the purposes of gratuity, and the other 40% of that will be deemed to be allowances. So not only is housing and utility lumped together, but all allowances are lumped together, and allowances are deemed to be 40% of the gross number. That is one common approach. The other approach tends to be what I call the salami package. You slice and dice the package into lots and lots and lots of little things. A housing allowance, a utilities allowance, a furniture allowance, a transport allowance, a fuel allowance, a salic allowance, a telephone allowance. And then there's the middle ground. Housing, which includes utilities, includes telephone and transport, which includes fuel and includes salic allowance. Personally, I'm in the middle ground. I'd like to keep it clean. Housing, that's all inclusive. Transport, that's all inclusive. But there are three different approaches. Okay, let's call time. I hope this last 45 minutes has been useful. And uh, thank you all for attending. It's been a, a pretty high attendance. And I hope to, uh, to speak to you all again on a future webinar later in the year. So thank you and have a good evening to you all. Bye-bye.